All right. My name is Joe Fenton. I was born in Poland, May the 6th, 1919. I was liberated the same day on my birthday, which was a big occasion for me. I have a few stories to tell you, but true stories. First of all, how I lost my family. This is the day I went to work, and together we had to do all kinds of work. And one day they had a section sealed off and uh, took all the people out. They had to, everybody had to get out. And they took him on trucks down to a part of the city, which is, was Lodge, to a railroad station. And uh, getting home from work, I found out that this particular section was taken that particular day, and my parents, my family were gone. I, have, I was fortunate to run into a man who was running a streetcar, and I asked him to do me a favor to take me out to that railroad station. Maybe I can still get a hold to see my family. As I came down, the trains were moving around. This was a fest. They did a very fast job on those people to, to take him out from the ghetto. And I, my family was in that particular train. I never seen him anymore. This consists of two brothers, three sisters, my mother and my father. My mother was 53 years old. My father was 57 years old. And I have never seen him anymore. Now there's another story. Excuse me for a minute. To get emotional. After this, since I lost him, well, I had to finally live with this uh, in my mind that whatever will happen, hope with hope that maybe someday I will see him. A couple of days later, as I was going to work, I seen SS and Gestapo standing. They gave an order to the Jewish community to get all the religious people, all the rabbis, all those educated people dressed in holiday clothes to meet at one particular place. Across the street, we, I didn't know at that time what is going to happen to those people, but they all had to walk in dressed up like, I don't know if you ever seen in Europe, you know, a rabbi with this fair things. They all came in dressed, and I mean, famous, finest people, and they shoved them all in and it, on those trucks, pickup trucks. The minute they got in, they started to be kicked already. And I don't know exactly how many, but probably must have been at least close to 100 of them. They took him away. Later on, we found out about 30 miles away from, from the city, and they killed them all in this forest. How do we know it? We had a man who was driving with those trucks, came back, happened to be a Pole, who the Germans took to help them get rid of those Jukes, and he mentioned to us, this is what happened to those people, they killed them all. This was another second story I will never forget as long as I live. Another story, well, I will never forget as I live, is in the hospital. They came in one day and they evacuated all the sick people and the children, born children. They had trucks. One particular case was they took children, threw them down to the second, third floor on the, on the, on the trucks. Screams was going to the seven heaven from the mothers, but they couldn't do anything. They were beaten up, and they took all those people away, which we have never seen anymore. There was a case, and how the war, as the war was going on, we had to go to work, and there were just every few months we had different stories to pick up people, take them out of sick, and especially children and elderly people. They were after them all the time, picked them up. Finally, in '44, the ghetto was evacuated. They took us all out. They took us. This I will never forget. They took us all down to the railroad station. They were we were packed like animals, or worse than animals. A street, uh, let's assume a car could take in uh, 30, 40 people. We were at least probably 500 of us just pressed together in a, in a car. Like they showed you one day, they ever watched the films, they show you one screaming children and everybody, whoever they had it, and just pressed in. And we were not just walking and kicked into the, to the cars in a way that they didn't do even to the animals what they did to us. We didn't know where we were going. And they were taking one uh, train after another one, and finally we arrived in a place we didn't know at that time that what Auschwitz was. 
what the name meant, anything, until when we arrived, they had an orchestra waiting for us. Can you imagine? Orchestra playing, greeting us. So we thought we were going into, like they said in the beginning, we are going to a working place. We are going to work and they are going to feed us. But when we arrived, we had the sense right away there's something wrong. You could see people walking around like wild, completely in those dressed the way we were dressed. Did you see the uniform with those stripes and things like this? But we couldn't figure out anything. First of all, they told us to take everything, the clothes, whatever had the best clothes. Why we, uh, you know, we go to a working camp, but which we have never seen it. We got off the train and we just went into a place. It was a big, big front on the front of a. Before we got into the barracks, anyhow, there was a man standing over there, which I will never forget as long as I live. Mengele, Doctor Mengele. The man, we didn't know at that time what his intentions were. Whatever he was standing around, deep eyes was a whip. He was separating the people women and children to the left, and whoever didn't, he didn't like. The looks, we had to pass by him, left or right. And we were friends going through this line, and a lot of friends, I had my brother-in-law. Friends, cousins, relatives, which we never seen. We didn't know what happened to the, on the left side. And on the right side, they took us into a, place which was called Badenanstalt, means a place where you're going to take a shower, they're going to wash you up and all the things. And the women and children, they took to the left. And they took him into a place which later on we found out they were all guests. To us they gave us a shower and uh, whatever clothes they had handy. And uh, we had to wait to be assigned to certain blocks. But as time was going on, we ran into the old people which were ready for years in Auschwitz, telling us the story that whoever we had went to the left, we should forget about it. Those people are dead. They were gassed. And while we were washing, taking showers, now comes back to us. We had screams, but we didn't know where the screams coming from. What we found out later on, they used to play around a little bit. They didn't put in enough gas in those holes. So the people were just, you know, dying with, with pain, screaming. Probably you could hear to the seventh heaven, screams over there. But we were in Auschwitz, and uh, we waited for a while. They took us to certain works, and uh, we stayed over there for a few weeks. And uh, we were assigned to different camps. Our particular group went to a coal mine. It was called Riddletau in Schlesia. This was a part which was the Polish and the Polish German, close to the Polish German border over there. We had to go down and work in the coal mines, and this was an experience by itself. It wasn't a modern coal mine. They gave us a shovel and a, and a chopper to go down. We had to crawl on our elbows. Dripping water was dripping in our heads, and we couldn't say no. We had to do our work. And clothes, we only had one set of clothes, whatever they gave us, ripped up. We walked out wet, and we went to sleep with this wet clothes. It was winter, cold, on the way home that clothes was frozen. Many times we took it off, you could put it on the table just like a, to stand up. And at night we had no choice, we took it off, and this was just laying whatever a space we had over there, and uh, in the morning we had to put it on and go back to work, the same thing. We worked over there, in which every day we had people killed. Every day, taking them out from the mines. There's another place I'll never forget, this, which we, we had went through hell. From over there, we were quite a while, finally the Russians were coming in closer, we, they took us out again on the road. There were quite a few thousands of us, more than half of them never made it. They got sick. Anybody got sick, they shot him. They didn't waste any time to take him or help him out, whatever. The one who, even if you couldn't make it, we, once in a while we just put our arms around 
a stronger one to just hang on. Otherwise, if they assess and they stop with the ones which are in charge of our group, we want them to see that we cannot walk. So we had to walk. And this was going on for, for close to two weeks until finally we arrived in Czechoslovakia. No water, nothing, just going. Even a little snow they wouldn't let us take in your mouth, you know, a little, just snow to get wet. How we made it, it's just a, it's a God thing, it's, it's very hard to describe. While we were in Czechoslovakia for a while, so Czechs were very nice to us in that particularly short time we stayed over there. They couldn't understand what happened to us, and we could talk Polish, and they understand a little Polish. So they were asking us what happened, so we told them, we don't know, we're going to, they take us away somewhere. They were throwing in their lunches on the places where we were standing over there. How did that feel? That it's, uh, they were very emotional, very, very nice people, very nice. A locomotive came over, which had warm water, and stopped to give us warm water. We had no cups, nothing, so they were giving us their cups, whatever they had. And, uh, you know, you can imagine the fights, everyone wanted to have a little water. We were dying for a little water, so he told us we shouldn't fight. He will bring us plenty of water for everybody. Let us everybody drink as much as he wanted. But you can imagine, it's impossible to describe the fight. Somebody got a hold of a little water and everybody else wanted water. And they couldn't take it. And some of them, they want us to jump from the, from away from over there, which a few of them went away. They took him in among themselves. The Czechs, among, from our people, you understand what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. We were standing, and the Czechs standing on the railroad over there said, you want to get away from the group? We will take you. So whoever had a chance, if the assessment happened to walk by a little further now, he told me, said to the right, they went to the left, and a few of those people ran away. Mm -hmm. The Czechs took him in among himself and walked away with him. Mm -hmm. They took him in in the middle, so they couldn't see the, the, who the people are. Mm -hmm. And some of them were saved this way. Not a lot of them, but a few of them got away and, and were saved. And from over there, they took us into a big, big room, I don't know, kind of a room. I, I assume, we assume in that time this was a room. They were fixing the railroad cars. They had all kinds of parts for the railroad to stay overnight and we were put in, in trains. They had to wait for trains coming in, different trains. And they put us again on those trains and again we were going. We didn't know where we were going. Quite a few days finally we arrived. At that time we didn't know this was in, in Austria. It was the middle of the night. This is the story I told our West Virginia members when we went to Vienna, to Mauthausen. Twelve o'clock like at night, we had to get out of the trains and go. And we were told not to say one word. It was probably 10 or 15 degrees below zero. And we were walking up the mountains. We, where we were going, we had no idea. Just to tiptoe. Beautiful place, but finally took us up, all the way up on the hill. And uh, this was Mauthausen the camp. We walked in the Mauthausen, so they looked at us over and we had to stay outside. By groups, they were taking us down to a, a room to take a shower. At the same time, he had to be undressed. Whoever had a little scratch on his body, they took him to the left. We didn't know, so he got undressed, we went in, they gave us a hot shower. We had to, after the shower, they gave us just a little overhead, overhead not over like a, a nightgown you have. It wasn't a nightgown, it was something like a shirt. But I don't know how you can call this, just to cover yourself. And they let us get out on that appel plus, they call it, to stay. Just stay, and that's it. We don't know for what and how long. Six o'clock, this was going on. We stayed until we got into the show, I think it was about 5 o'clock in the morning. It started from 5 o'clock in the morning. And the first group had to stay outside, which I was among those first groups, till 5 o'clock at night, barefooted, standing on snow. Standing. We were just standing and doing like this all the time with our feet, you know. 
Oh. And after taking a shower, which probably was a hundred degree water or more, and the people which went to the left, we didn't see them anymore. We didn't know where they went. They don't. We found out the crematorium was over there at Mudhouse, and they were burned over there and killed in Mudhausen. So we had to wait till five o'clock in the afternoon until finally we had assigned some to certain blocks, all kinds of blocks. I don't know. I was in a block twenty, and uh, they let us rest up a little bit in those blocks, and we were assigned to go to work. Work which uh, no human body can ever do. This, if you could give me today a billion dollars for uh, an hour to do what we did over there. I wouldn't be able to do it. How we did it, I don't know. It is the will. It's the, the dream, maybe, maybe uh, the next day will be better. But we did. How we did it, you cannot, uh, we cannot even describe this. We had to go down. If you watch the Holocaust picture, mm -hmm. they built 123 steps. But the way the steps were built, a very unusual way. To go down was hard. But being down there, we had to carry those stones up on top to build factories. And they looked at you, and you had downstairs people, you know, like children going to school, they carry the books. Mm -hmm. So they looked at you, for instance, I was a little man, they put in 100 pounds, 150 pounds. How can you carry it? Luckily, I don't know how, wherever they put in, how I, I walked up there, I don't know. But I seen some people could make it. And... You know, the weight pulled them down, and they were going down the stairs like this, knocked the stones and their heads killed. You know, every day we had dead people killed over there. Once in a while, if a man could do it, could come up, there was one man standing over there and just kicked you down like this. So again, you went down those stairs. And this was going on every day, every day, every day. This was going for quite a while. How we survived, don't ask, has to be a, it's a miracle. Miracles are not enough. With the little food, what we got, little food, was, I don't know how you can call it, probably was bread made out of sodas with a little flour. But this is what we got. Until one day, we had a new assignment to load us up on, on uh, buses, buses, not buses, trucks. We were taken into a place called Ebensee, which I was liberated together with Dr. Getz. I didn't even know at that time Dr. Getz. This was the worst of the worst human being can ever see. This was a city built in the mountains. It's still there today. It's called Stolen. The Germans built a city and they were working, after the war we found out, they were making the V1 rockets and the V2 rockets. And we had to build the, city, the factories inside. You can imagine just as bad as we had in the coal mines and in the mountains as even worse. Ripping holes, you know, on those stones. You had a, a, how do you call it, a vein with those stones and they were just falling off on your head, you know, like uh, flies. And every day we were carrying out dead people from this place. They built a whole railroad was going into this place over there. And we had to work on this place until we were almost liberated. And the work we did, it's... I cannot describe you, and nobody else in this world can describe you, how a human being can do it. But when you have somebody over you who stands around with a whip and a gun, and uh, you didn't care anymore. Many times we said, uh, you're better dead than alive. You know, it's, uh, you had so much whatever left in you, and from one side you had a little dream, maybe the next day, maybe uh, pretty soon, maybe something will happen, but we, our, our thoughts were completely lost. You know, like you go somewhere in a place and you have no end to it. Same thing we thought, what is going to be next? But, Fortunately, we had a man in those uh, stone working who was a civilian engineer and he started to give us a little information. He was a very nice man <coughs> telling us that the Americans are ready in the, from Italy, coming into Italy, to Africa. 
we should have patience. We should uh, do the best not to let us down. Maybe he's just probably soon the day will come that we will be free. And to tell everybody in the blocks, he says, to keep, not to uh, lose hope. He says, hope is around the corner, but whoever will make it, it's the only way you can be a very nice man. And we used to get back to the blocks, and people always, we were telling the kids, you know what they say, that Americans are coming pretty close. And uh, So we just pulled ourselves together until one day they had a, we had to go out in a Pellplatz, it's called, this is a place you stay in, a, like a parking lot. And the chief of the heavens, he says, we all, the Americans and the Russians are pretty close. We, they want us to go into those stone. They're going to hide us. They're going to bomb the whole concentration camps and instead to be dead, we can be alive if we go into those places. In the meantime, they knew the, the Germans what will happen. But our Lag Eliste was we were having a man who was an Austrian. He was a political prisoner. He was a prisoner himself too, but he was not Jewish. He was an Austrian. He was in charge, responsible for the people inside. And he right away had a meeting with us to tell us we should never go to those stolen. If the minute we go in, we will be killed. They had mined all those stolen. And if we would have gone in, not even one of us would be today alive to tell the story. So we said, we are not going to go. When they called, everybody should go out, and nobody came out. We didn't care what was going to happen. In the meantime, the Americans were going so fast, close to, to Austria, said the Germans, the last three days, we didn't go to work. We didn't know why. But we were sitting, we had no food, nothing to eat, but just to sit in. But eventually we start to add up the two and two that what this engineer was telling us could be that this is true. And I personally will never forget, I went in, in the kitchen, there was a little kitchen, which they normally used to cook over there for us something, but they didn't cook. And how I got on top of it, this was the 5th of May, before my, my, my birthday. Just in my mind, and I wanted to look up and see what happened. Maybe we'll see somebody coming close to us. I spent the whole day on the 5th, I didn't see anybody. The 6th in the morning, I did the same thing. I climbed with another boy. How we got on top of the kitchen, I don't know. It was what strength. But I got on top. We were sitting and everyone was screaming, do you see anything? About before noontime, didn't have a watch, but it was close to noontime. Finally, we see a big like a house moving, coming in our directions. We didn't know what this meant, whatever it is, but they were coming closer, moving, so we were still afraid. We thought maybe the Germans are coming over there, and now they're going to clean us up, finish off the story. So I was sitting, I said, we don't care whatever it is, but I, the boys were asking, what kind of tanks are there? I said, I cannot see exactly what it is. When they got closer, we see stars. Normally we didn't realize in that time that the Russians had a red star and the Americans had a white star on their tanks. And finally as close as they come into we see in a big tank like a house with a white star coming closer and he, they ripped the wires. I let out a screen probably to the seventh heaven. How I did it, when I had the strength, I don't know. When I screamed to the boys that, our, you know, Muta, we didn't know that all the Germans left already during the night, and they left Hungarian Wehrmacht, they called it, but they were, you know, Hungarian Germans during the war, which were working together with the Germans as Gestapo. They let them uh, uh, watch our camps, but they, the Germans themselves, ran away at night. We didn't know until this tank came over, and we caught a few of those old Hungarian SS, Gestapo, whatever they are. They were all the people, and we seen those Americans. What can I tell you? You can see whoever stood around over there, crying was not enough. We didn't know what to do. And uh, the man who opened that hood, the first one, I was, he came over to the kitchen over there. I was the first one to jump down, and boys over there, and that man looked at us, and he didn't know what to say. We couldn't communicate. 
we couldn't speak English, and he couldn't speak our language. But right away he went on the, we could see he picked up a telephone and he started to call. So we were asking him, uh, what language can you know, uh, Polish, German, Deutsch, uh, whatever. One of those people in that tank walked out and he says he, is, uh, he can speak Polish. He is from Chicago. I said, you speak my language. But he spoke like an American Paul. And he looked at us, I says, and he was smoking at that time. A cigarette, and I asked him, "Can I get a cigarette?" And he took out. He gave me a package of camels. I was always almost, almost killed mm. by the people, you know, which uh, from the other, you know, uh, people. So he says, "Don't do it." In about thirty minutes, another truck will come over. I think will bring you over some cigarettes and other things. Just have patience. Tell the people not to worry. You are free now. We are going to bring over a kitchen for you. We will bring over a hospital. And where are the people? I says, the most of them were laying around. Some of them couldn't walk. So he would like to go see them. So we took him in. And he was dead. It's okay. <coughs> You're crying he was crying, but yeah. And I'm standing here. He says, I'm coming from Africa. I haven't, I've seen things, but this I haven't seen. People laying one on top of each other. And this is my leader. Just, what did you do? How? He says, we don't know. And how they came over about, I would say about an hour and a half later, we had some trucks came over, brought some food over. And he was begging us not to eat the meat. You know, we all dried out. And he says, we should have patience. They'll bring a kitchen, they will cook uh, milk, rice, he says, we'll give you. He was telling me in Polish and I was telling the people. But meantime, boys were hungry. They jumped on those trucks and started to grab those canned meat, which a lot of them died. They couldn't digest, you know, they had diarrhea. And, and we lost a few thousand of those people after the war, just from diarrhea. They were so dried out. and. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, you have to forgive me. But they did a tremendous job. They started to right away come over and uh, help us. What I mean help is uh, doctors. They scales, they weighed me and I weighed 85 pounds. I have a proof, I have at home a little card they gave us as a memento. Well, I was the fortunate one of them. I grew up in sport and I knew how to conduct myself. I didn't grab any meats. I was listening, but they told us, and they gave us, they brought in the American uh, Russian, they had on the front, they had this hard bread, which we couldn't eat. You don't know me, I don't know if you know how the Americans, during the war, they didn't have any fresh bread, so they gave them like crackers, but they were bigger, bigger ones, very, very hard. So we used to, they used to give us hot milk, and we used to take the crackers and put it inside, get it soft a little bit. But they helped us in the beginning, whatever they could do to bring us back on our feet. And in that time, we didn't know, maybe about two, three weeks later, Eisenhower came over to our camp with his whole staff. In that time, they were burning the crematorium, and our camp was burning dead bodies in Ebersee. They had a crematorium too in the beginning, but lately, the last six months, they didn't gas people but they were burning dead bodies. And if a dead body is burning, the body keeps lifting up high until the... When Eisenhower walked over to this crematorium and he seen this thing, he thought this was still, li you know, uh, live people. He said, shut it off, you should close this, this thing, which they did. And uh, he gave out orders, the whole city from heaven, they had to come in. Dick, we lost in that time, we had, I don't know how many dead people laying around. Like you see these pictures, they had a leg over there, and they are buried over there. They had to make holes, and the whole city had to come in, including the mayor. Walk through and take everybody and bury it. This was Eisenhower's order. We didn't know at that time who Eisenhower was. We had no idea. We had no idea in the war what it is. But we had a book after the war, which I don't know what happened to us. I lost it. A very valuable book for you would be, no money could buy this. The whole war 
they they made a book out of it, and we had a copy of it. And uh, we were liberated, but we had no no place uh, to go. Nobody. The only place everybody wanted to go back to your own, uh, roots. You wanted to go back to see what happened, uh, place where you came from. But uh, I was unfortunate. I, I had never found anybody from my family. They were all cousins, and uh, a lot of them I lost everybody. But uh, one day the Red Cross came over, and the Red Cross tells us the liberated women. We didn't know there were women in, uh, not far away from, they were part of Mauthausen too. And they were about 60 miles away from us. And so they said on a Sunday, whoever wants to go, and they had people, they had written down people from Poland, from this city, from certain cities, and they had quite a few girls from my city, where I came from. So we said, we'll go over and meet us. There were a lot of Hungarian women. And out of 500, I think there were half of them Hungarian, half of them from Poland. And uh, we went over to meet those women. We never knew that they something exists. They didn't know that men were liberated even in this particular part of it. This is how I met my wife. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had to start. We went back. I went back to uh, Poland to find out if I had anybody left, which I didn't. And I just uh, left Poland. I had no intention to stay there. The they were so unkind to our people that you had no heart to stay anymore in this country. They could have helped us a lot. They could do a lot of things for the Jewish people, but they didn't want it. We had trouble with them shortly before the war broke out. They were already starting to beat up Jews on the streets. Like uh, pre-war, so I, I personally just left Poland. I says I don't want to see it anymore. And uh, I just walked out and walked away. It was a good cry. Mm -hmm. The places where I was born and raised. I thought maybe I'll find some things, pictures from the family, which I don't have any. Mm -hmm. I couldn't even get into the house. Paul told me that. Uh, uh, Captain from the security lives in our apartment. He says, We say, Luck, don't ever go. And he says, They will kill you. Which they did right after the war. Even the Poles killed quite a few mm -hmm. Jewish people after the war. And I just decided, What do I have to look for over there anymore? I just picked myself up and left. But I have, I knew before the war I had relatives in Canada and the United States. I didn't know the address. I didn't know, I knew the names, but I didn't know the address. And this is, I found my family in Canada. And through my family in Canada, I found my uncle. And he made papers. And this is how we came over to this country. In 1949, I had papers in 1946, but they changed, the uh, United States changed the uh, law, immigration law. I think was, in that time it was Truman. Changed it, we had to wait from 46 to 49, until we could finally, finally leave. Europe and come over this country. And this is where our home is now. Mm -hmm. Now, listening to your story, you're obviously such an energetic person, and over and over again in what you were saying was uh, the sense that you were watching people being taken away, your family, friends. Well, I lost my family. This is like I told you, I lost my family. I didn't even see them say goodbye. Right. While I was at work, when I got home, they were gone already. And when I wanted to see, maybe I could do get him out or whatever, they were gone, and I've never seen them anymore. Whatever happened to them, I have no idea. And I assume happened to them, whatever happened to my family happened to all those people. They were gassed, burnt, whatever. Where I have, I wish I would have known it. I have no place. How do you make your peace with that? Well, peace, you have, uh, you make peace. I was the only one left. Unless I have to leave, uh, just continue a family. What else could you do? You are left uh, like in a jungle. If you want to survive, you have to remember. Think about it. 
but uh, you have to continue. If I disappear, if I would just decide that I don't want to live anymore, the whole family would be gone. There's nobody any left to tell anything about it, whatever happened to us. So at least I'm the one, like my uncle was asking what happened to his brother, which was my father. So I told him. If I wouldn't be there, who would ever tell him? Who would he ask? Or my family in Canada, which I do have a large family, but this is third, fourth generation Canadians. But they still wanted to know what, what happened. And if I wouldn't be around, whoever would ever told them whatever happened to my family, at least they know, like I know. But being young, you just decided what else could you do. In the beginning, you were just like, it's very hard to describe, I hope no, it doesn't happen to anybody. You were kind of a, living in a shadow. You think, just a short time ago I had a family, I had brothers and I had sisters, now I don't have them anymore. But you see uh, people still working and existing and going around starting to put the little pieces together, this puzzle, and continue to live. So the beginning was a hex, heck of a life. You know, the first, I would say the first year, you still, that's all we will talk about it. Did you hear anything about anybody left in your family? Anybody left in your family? Everybody was asking everybody, did you hear anything about my family? Did you hear anything about his family? And I went to the Red Cross and they asked him, they were looking all over Europe. Maybe, you know, I was fortunate, I was known in sport, so they, they knew my name. And they helped me a lot, but if anybody would be alive, I would hear about it. But unfortunately, nobody was alive. In this particular time, when they took my parents and my sisters and brothers out, out of that time, this was in 1941, nobody was ever alive from this group. After the war, when we were asking people, we had no reports about anybody left alive. So I had to learn to adjust myself. I have a daughter, which she knows the story. We don't talk all the time about it, but she knows what happened, how it happened. And you cannot pile, the way we look at it, we don't want our children to forget about it. But you cannot put a pressure on a child and force the child to live with it all every day. Psychologically it wouldn't work. The child would just grow up with a hatred. Why, why did they do it to my grandfather? Why did they do it to my, to my grandmother? So we keep telling, we just keep, they know, uh, she knows the whole story, but uh, we don't talk all the time about it. For instance, tonight we know, my daughter knows we're going, we have an affair, we have to go see a uh, professor coming in. What we do, what is the reason for it? why we are doing it, that the world should never forget. I had cases in this United States, people which were questioning me, people, non-Jewish people, and uh, I just cannot, one was just, I didn't ask him anything, but something came up, the firm where we said, Joe, do I understand you want concentration camp? I said, yeah. Me, you were telling me you, I, the way I heard you were 85 pounds and you work in coal mine, I just don't believe it. Just like that. Mm. So I just told that man, I says, have you served the armed forces? He says, no. Have you been overseas? No. So I said, don't question me. You have no idea. Either you have something against the Jewish people, or you live with a... a, a a dream something that uh, the whole story was just a fiction story. This is not a fiction story. This is a true story. If you like to believe it, it's fine. If you don't believe it, don't believe it, but don't question me. You have no right to question me. You have, no, you have never had an experience to see those people or to fight in that war that people which liberated those people. So I says, he just looked at He didn't like what I told him, but I didn't care. But they also had people very, people which were the third, the fourth, and the seventh army. They are the ones that are witnesses to this. They are the ones liberating us. 
and I had an fortune things. I was after the war, and uh, this is a beautiful thing, which I, I like it. To me, it makes me feel good. An American, I met an American in uh, Munich. The reason I left Austria later on to Germany is, um, I found out I have a lot of friends from before the war. Eventually, I had to look after the war for some friends. You lost your family, you don't have any close ones. Who are you going to look for? People which we know each other. And I happened to meet an American, a very fine man, and uh, they couldn't help themselves. The Americans, you know, they wanted to go somewhere to a nightclub. And I helped them, I could speak German. And uh, so I used to help him to get around a little bit. And we got close and uh, friendly. Finally, one day he says, I have to go home. I'm going back to the United States. And I just wished him very well. And I says, I hope someday I can be in the United States and do something for you. He looked at me. You know, he could speak a little bit German, the same American, but he was not the German descent. In 1950, I worked in a place in Los Angeles, and one day that man walked in. I didn't know in the beginning. That man walked in, and he looked at me, and I looked at him. He says, I knew you from somewhere. And I says, I know you too, but I cannot place you. He says, what is your name? He says, Joe. Joseph! started to scream, yeah. He says, you remember? Oh, my dear. You know where we met? He says, in Munich, Germany. I says, what are you in for? He says, I, my relatives are in a meat business. I'm going to start a route as a job, and I happen to be a house salesman in this particular company. Mm -hmm. And I says, i tell you what I will do for you. We need some credit. I went into our credit manager, and I told him, I says, I want you to give this man $500 credit. If he isn't going to pay, you take it off my wages, but I want to give him a break. I said, that man, and I told him the story. I met him in Germany and Munich, how nice he was to us, helping us, anything to do. And uh, so he was going around in the city telling everybody what a uh, little me, a refugee, came over to this country helping them, mm -hmm. which to me, I helped a lot of those people. Later on, as time goes on, I says, anybody who came over, just to pay back why the Americans were so nice to us, it's very hard to describe. You left alone, they came over, they didn't know what to do. You need any treatments, you need any, anything to help. Why they seen it, they were the first ones to look at those dead people, people which were walking, dead people walking around. Can you imagine, this is just like a dream. You see a little puppets on a string, this is the way people were walking. Like puppets. How they could walk, I don't. You know, you look at me today, would you believe that I weigh 85 pounds? You wouldn't believe it. I myself many times don't even think, but I was fortunate I was not a big eater. I was always as a kid to control myself in sport. Maybe through this I am alive. But all the big eaters couldn't exist. They just went very fast. So it's things like this which you, you uh, have to live with it. But we want the world to know, we want everybody to know that things like this existed and we hope should never exist. Today when you hear and read the papers what is going on in Iran and different countries, how they, a person is nothing. You take an Arab countries over there, they take an individual has nothing to say. They just take him out, no, no, no judge, nothing. They are the judge. Kokomeni, excuse me for the things, takes those people. They, they say, according to the reports, once in a while you hear at night that he killed 150,000 people without even having a court. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine what happened to the war. So they killed, normally they killed 6, 000, 6 million Jews, but they killed 11, 11 half million people, Jews and non Jews, for no reason whatsoever. I used to see, I have to tell you a story. And the ghetto, they used to bring in every night to the cemetery, black pickup trucks, vans, dark. And they used to bring in over there, and we used to hear, we didn't know what happened. We used to hear like a little crackers at night, you know, from the, for far away. We had to work at nights too many times. Vroom, like a machine gun shooting. We found out the Germans used to bring in their own people, which were against them intellectuals, and kill them in the Jewish cemetery, and bury them in the Jewish cemetery. So you can imagine, how can we not 
tell these stories to the world, said we should, uh, uh, we hope we never have to live through or get somebody vicious like the Hitler group, Hitler and his group. I've never seen Hitler, but I've seen Himmler. To describe your Himmler, it's just, you, look at, you could look at his face, this viciousness on his face, it's just hard to describe. The same thing like Mengele, the Dr. Mengele. They were having fun. This one night we had, you know, comes back to those stories, I can tell you stories for weeks. Two young uh, mages walked into the barracks, and this was in uh, coal mine, yeah. Drunk? What? Where are you from? And they started to shoot at us from nowhere, just having fun. And the other guy was taking pictures. Can you imagine people? To have fun, to go into people, shoot him, kill him, and the other guy would take pictures. One man walked around with a dog. That dog was as big as a cow. This was a young man, a major, a German Gestapo. The dog was trained in a way he would walk over, we were standing on a Pellplatz, means they were looking us over every day to be sure that so many people are around. And he used to walk, walk by. If he didn't like his looks, your looks, he just did to the dog like this, and the minute you were dead, the dog jumped and you grabbed you by the throat, or by the, you know, below the, in a second you were dead. For the kicks, and the next guy was taking pictures of it. What went through your mind when you saw that? Well, you, just, uh, you didn't know what to think. You know, you, you were kind of a... Well, scaredness is not enough. I've seen cases where a father and a son were fighting. They were laying on those uh, wooden places tied with a little shirt they had. The son was afraid he's going to lose his father. He couldn't take it anymore, or vice versa. Why the wires around us were it was electricity. So we had many cases that uh, people jumped on those wires. They couldn't take it anymore. So they decided to what the heck to live. There's not, not nothing to live for. They just jumped on those wires. And every morning we had people hanging on those wires. Electrocuted, you know. And this particular case, a very famous musician from our city, his son couldn't take it anymore and he just separated himself. And the father, in the morning we had screams, we don't know what happened. And he walked out, there was his son on those wires. Mm. A young boy couldn't take it anymore. We have about nine or ten minutes left. So those stories, it's kind, you start to remember things, for instance, seen in the ghettos where a German, can you imagine, looking up, mm -hmm. people walking down from windows and he was taking crack shots, going over, shooting, and if a kid was hanging down there, fell down on the, on the side, just for the kicks. So a human body, a human being was nothing, comparing to, to the to the free world, but we didn't know. We our mind was completely. We were completely shut off. We didn't care. Our existence. We had no existence. We didn't know what will happen the next day, the next minute, the next hour. Every few minutes, something else happened. Every the same thing is in the camps. You didn't know you were going to work if you're going to come back. Sick, you couldn't afford to get sick. The minute you got sick, you were gone. They, can, they didn't keep sick people. Even if you were healthy, you couldn't, you had a rough time to survive. But sickness was the worst thing. And you've seen uh, people close to your friends and, 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 and uh, relatives disappear, just like they never existed. So our mind, we were completely, I never believed in my life that if we are going to be free, we used to envy a cat, a bird, fly nobody bothers them. They can go wherever they want to go. We couldn't go where we wanted to go. We were limited to our speech. We were limited to our get-together. They kept telling us always in the barracks we shouldn't talk. We shouldn't, they don't want to hear any voices. We had to lay, whisper. We had to obey, not just obey, you know, soldier has to obey uh, rules too, but to us, we were nothing to those people. So we just didn't know what is going to happen the next day. We never dreamed of it. So we, one day we'll be able to be free and tell the story. We were just waiting where we are going to die next. Who's going to be next? 
And yet you had a special opportunity, right, to go back to Mauthausen as a free man. Well, this was this is the reason I took our our Schwein Club, Americans, which had no idea how a concentration camp looked, how a crematorium looked, and this was we were in in, in seventy and seventy seven. Yes, in seventy seven. And I took down the group, went into the place I was in that camp and I showed them the crematoriums and the torture rooms. You can imagine after so many years. Today you pass by those rooms that blood is still on the walls. They didn't clean it up. Left it over there. The smell today is still the same smell as it was during the torture time. They left it as it is. So when we had a group of how many do we have at that time? We had a uh, I think it was 180 or 200. I don't remember how, many, how big the group was. I was, and I just I couldn't go through the things anymore. I told him, "You go through, but I cannot go in." And I says, "My heart doesn't let me go through, but you go through all the way now. You will come up the stairs and you come back on this place." And when they got up, they didn't know what to say. So there is a, a memorial in Mauthausen standing over there with names written down, all nationalities which were killed over there, and I had a little speech. I have a picture of it. So you had those people standing, young and old, crying. And I told them nothing but a true story, just a little bit of it. So I says, at least now you have an idea. When you hear about concentration camps, you hear about torture things, a little bit. You couldn't... This is just a short little story. Now you can imagine the whole story from 1939 till 1945, what happened. Which... It's very hard, I says, if I have to tell you stories, I have to sit down for a year and tell you stories. Every minute was a different story. Every minute. Going to work, coming from work, going down to, to the coal mines, going down to the, those things, how we were treated and kicked. But this we didn't pay attention to it anymore. Why life was mean, meaningless. We didn't know what will happen. Many times you were praying, maybe the next day I shouldn't get up. Forget about it. You know, just be better off, which a lot of them did. But at least oh, you wanted to know, maybe someday you'll be able to tell the story. This is what keeps you alive. With hope. So let's hope one day. And fortunately, unfortunately, fortunately, I'm the only one in my family. I can tell you a little stories about it, but I assume it's uh, it's just unbelievable to live through these things. Try to find a new life, start a new life, getting married, raise children, and uh, tell the stories. But you cannot keep telling them all the time. Eventually. To some people, don't want to listen to the true story. You have people that don't want to listen. They don't believe it. That's they keep telling you, no, they say, I don't believe it. I had those once in a while. But how can you force him to believe? You just can't do it. You have to tell them as it is and let them pick up whatever they think. But all I, mean, I assume every one of us telling you those stories is telling you nothing but the truth, just a little bit of it, just a tiny little bit, what we went through. And this is why we, we have, uh, my, from, uh, particularly me, I had an obligation to this country. I was liberated by the Americans. They were so kind to us. And anything I could do for the Americans, which I did during the years I was in uh, this company working, all those people just a little bit return to make their life a little easier, which I did. It makes me feel good. But in our way of life, we just uh, keep, we have to, uh, we get together like we do in our group. We have all different kinds of groups doing things, charity things. For all domination, not just for the Jewish people, for anybody who needs help, we know what help means. And uh, we hope to prevent so the Holocaust like this should never happen anymore. The main thing to us is the children in the schools should know about it. Not to believe like we had this, uh, was it a professor in a school who said that the Holocaust never happened. Right. 
This is the most horrible statement a person can make. The third, fourth, and the seventh army has all the documents about the liberating, liberating concentration camps. We had those books after the war. I don't know why they pulled them out from, from existing. They have them. I imagine in their library. The, but there were books printed after the war. In every city, you could go into the, uh, like the mayor in the city, and they had books showing you this particular camp was liberated, how the dead people were laying around over there, which army liberated, how they found the people over there. There's proof to it. And they were showing even pictures among the army. You know, they were leaving the army on the first front, the ones which were fighting, let them go home, and they were replacing them. This new, excuse me, this new uh, soldiers, but they were showing them the pictures. I know it. And now they cut it out. I don't know who gave those orders. I assume at that time it was Eisenhower. Maybe the German government had an influence on it. But they do have documents. The, the, I think the finest documents you can have is the army had it. Do you worry that uh, the story is going to be forgotten? I hope not. This is why we do our work. This is why we, we wanted to be sure that our children, that our grandchildren, or the future things, even not just the Jewish people, anybody. It's happened to a few other million people, non-Jewish people, which were killed the same way. But the way they were killed, the way they killed my parents, the way they killed innocent people. You know, you go to a court, you kill somebody, the judge gives you a you're a vicious man, you're just a killer. So he says you have to die in the guest chamber. But we didn't kill anybody. We didn't harm anybody. We have done anything wrong except being good citizens. We were good citizens. We were good people. Uh, we're coming close to the end of yeah. the tape, and I wonder if there's any final statement that you would like to make. Well, the final statement I'd like to make, I hope whoever is well listening to this tape will believe the story and will work very hard for a country, for a cause. If they ever run into people who are anti-anybody, anti-religious, anti-nationalities, should learn a lesson from this what we went through, not to let these things happen, mm -hmm. to fight. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for telling us. This was very, very important for you to say, and we thank you for it. Well, this is the way I feel. Our story isn't to try to uh, prove that we were heroes. Like I keep telling Americans, that this country doesn't owe me anything. They were very kind to let us in, which I particularly had was fortunate to get papers to different countries, but I wanted this country. Even when I was young, my aim was always, I hope someday I could come to this country. But people, you know, we could never forget these things. And what Americans did in the war shouldn't be forgotten too. You know, there were the English, the French, the, the all different armies fighting the Germans. But what Americans did, they shouldn't be forgotten either. They were just outstanding. Great. <laughs>